A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth of Mamre. As Abraham sat in the entrance of his tent, while the day was growing hot, looking up, he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, if I may ask you this favor, please do not go on past your servant. Let some water be brought that you may bathe your feet and then rest yourselves under the tree. Now that you have come this close to your servant, let me bring you a little food that you may refresh yourselves, and afterward you may go on your way. The men replied, very well, do as you have said. Abraham hastened into the tent and told Sarah, quick, three measures of fine flour, knead it and make rolls. He ran to the herd, picked out a tender choice steer, and gave it to a servant, who quickly prepared it. Then Abraham got some curds and milk, as well as the steer that had been prepared, and set these before them. And he waited on them under the tree while they ate. They asked him, where's your wife, Sarah? He replied, there in the tent. One of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will then have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent just behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and Sarah had stopped having her womanly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I am so withered and my husband is so old, am I still to have sexual pleasure? But the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh and say, shall I really bear a child old as I am? Is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? At the appointed time, about this time next year, I will return to you and Sarah will have a son. Because she was afraid, Sarah dissembled, saying, I didn't laugh. But he replied, yes, you did. The word of the Lord. The Lord has remembered his mercy. The Lord has remembered his mercy. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The Lord has his mercy. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. The Lord has his mercy. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. The Lord has his mercy. He has come to help of his servant Israel. He has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. took away our infirmities 
Dominus vobiscus, Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Mateum. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, suffering dreadfully. He said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion said in reply, Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man subject to authority, with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come here, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Amen, I say to you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I say to you, many will come <clears throat> from the east and the west and will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be driven out into the outer darkness where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. The cent and, and Jesus said to the centurion, you may go. As you have believed, let it be done for you. And at that very hour, his servant was healed. Jesus entered the house of Peter and saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and waited on him. When it was evening, they brought him many who were possessed by demons, and he drove out the spirits by a word and cured all the sick. To fulfill what had been said by Isaiah the prophet, he took away our infirmities and bore our diseases. Verbum Domini. During this past week for daily mass, we finished listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which consists of intensive instruction for living a Christian life. And now we begin to see our Lord as he puts his words into practice. The first thing he does when he comes down from the mountain is heal a Jewish leper who has come to him in faith. And then in today's reading, a Roman centurion approaches him asking for healing for his servant. The centurion, who is a commander of a hundred soldiers, would be a rank comparable to that of an army sergeant today. And since he was a Roman, Roman, Roman officer, he would have been a representative of the Gentile nation that was occupying Jewish territory. For the most part, the Gentile, the <clears throat> Romans were tolerant of the Jewish religion and allowed the Jews to continue practicing it. However, there were some groups of Jews who vigorously opposed their Roman occupiers and who attempted to revolt against the Roman Empire. So the overall Jewish sentiment towards the Romans was mixed. Some could tolerate the Romans while others wanted to have nothing to do with them. And as a Roman, sold, Roman officer, the centurion would likely have been despised even more than the average Roman citizen. And yet it is the centurion who approaches Jesus and asks him in faith for healing for his servant. And realizing that the Jewish people might not be too receptive towards him, 
the centurion sees something different in Jesus. He can immediately see that Jesus is approachable, and he's willing to listen to others. We can relate to the centurion this way. It is easier and less anxiety-inducing to approach a person that we perceive as kind, gentle, and merciful. The centurion had confidence that the Lord would not act according to any bias against the Romans, but that the Lord would receive him warmly and listen to his request. And as soon as the centurion mentions the infirmity of his servant, Jesus says, I will come and cure him. And the original Greek in the text could also be translated into a question, which also makes sense in this context. Should I come and cure him? In other words, Jesus is asking the centurion whether he should come and heal his servant. And at the time of Jesus, a Jew would have been regarded as unclean if he even associated with a Gentile, let alone entered his house. Some biblical commentaries believe that Jesus may be expressing his annoyance with the thought of having to enter the house of a, of a centurion and thus defile himself. However, I don't think that this would have been Jesus' primary concern. After all, Jesus shows a lack of concern with other social mores, such as talking with women in public, which was also frowned upon. Instead, Jesus seems to be more concerned with making the gospel message known than he was about societal acceptance. And thus, when Jesus poses this question to the centurion, he brings out the centurion's hidden faith. The centurion responds with the words that we recite at every Mass. Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Again, several commentaries will say that the centurion is showing deference to Jesus as a Jew by showing respect for Jewish purity laws because he realizes that Jesus would be made unclean if he came into his house. However, I tend to agree with what St. Jerome says about this scene. St. Jerome believes that when the centurion looks at Jesus, he sees not a mere Jew, but the presence of divinity within Jesus. While it's possible that the centurion may have had a certain respect for Jewish purity, ritual purity laws, I don't think that this would have been his primary concern. The centurion says that he is not worthy to have Jesus enter under his roof, not because he wishes to spare Jesus from becoming unclean, but because of his profound humility and the presence of the divine. As a man in a position of authority himself, he can see that Jesus is also in a position of authority. As the centurion issues commands and his servants obey them, so Jesus issues forth his word and his word is fulfilled. And if we believe that the centurion was able to recognize the presence of divinity in Jesus, then Jesus' response to the centurion makes even more sense. Our Lord is thrilled and says that he has not found such faith in all of Israel, that is, among his own people. Since God had prepared his chosen people for the coming of the Messiah over centuries, they should have been able to recognize him immediately in Jesus. And yet the Lord is rejected by many of his own people, including in his own native town of Nazareth. On the other hand, the centurion, who was not raised as a Jew, nor did he worship as a Jew, was able to see Jesus with the eyes of faith. Jesus then says something that would have been shocking to his hearers. For centuries, the, Jew, the people of Israel would have regarded themselves as descendants of their father Abraham, and thus as the beneficiaries of the blessings promised to their father. 
However, Jesus turns this understanding on its head. It is no longer those who are mere physical descendants of Abraham who inherit God's promises to Abraham. After all, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, God can raise up sons of Abraham from the very stones. Rather, it is those who have faith who are reckoned as sons of Abraham. It is for this reason that Jesus says that many will come from the east and the west and will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying that the Gentiles who have faith will also be received as beneficiaries of the promise made to Abraham. As St. Paul points out in his letter to the Romans, faith has always been the basis of Abraham's relationship with God and the promises God made to him. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And yet even more shockingly, Jesus says, but the children of the kingdom will be driven out into the outer darkness where there'll be wailing and grinding of teeth. Hence those who are physical descendants, but who arrogantly reject Jesus and refuse to believe in him as Messiah and Lord despite seeing his works, will find themselves cast out of the kingdom. And so this is, this is an important message for the Israelites at the time, but this is an important message for all of us as well to remember as Catholic Christians. While it is true that we all enter the family of God, the church, by means of baptism and faith, this does not mean that nothing else is required of us. We should avoid the temptation to think that baptism is a free ticket to heaven and that we are saved simply by calling ourselves Christian. If we think that we are saved simply by our association to the church through baptism, then we really are no different than the Israelites who thought that they were beneficiaries of the promises to Abraham simply because of their physical descent. Our faith in Christ requires a response from us in the form of good works. The centurion's faith expressed itself in charity as he sought a healing on behalf of his servant. As St. James teaches in his letter, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. Our faith is a living faith that expresses itself through works of charity and mercy. We are called not to take advantage of our status as Christians, or just to appeal to the fact that we are Christians, but to truly live as disciples of Christ by making Christ's love and mercy known throughout the world.